All right, so final speaker before the coffee break, Magnus Hagen from Six and, in this case, for we. Yes, right. thank you very much. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about how we use data science and AI at our work at the Swedish Defense Research Agency, FOE, or FOE, uh, primarily working with text-based security applications. So as Daniel said, I represent both Six and FOE. I split my time between these organizations half-half nowadays. Uh, so I'll try to give an overview of how we work with these type of applications um, and also give some examples of work that we have done. Uh, so I'll try to cover uh, different areas here. So I'll just begin by uh, briefly describing how we approach this type of work. Uh, so our main focus is trying to develop uh, tools for analysts so computer support for doing analysis more efficiently. Um, that might mean that the analysts get access to more data. So instead of just following a few Twitter accounts, for example, they might get access to the entire Swedish Twitter feed. Or it might be that we will be able to provide analysis over longer periods of time. So following, for example, some internet forums over a period of a couple of years. So more information for the analyst to do its job. Uh, it might also be that we can provide other types of information, so new types of information um, that would be hard to do manually. So that might be, for example, using sentiment analysis on different web forums to, to track how the general mood develops over time. That's kind of hard to do if you're a single analyst. Um, so, being able to provide new types of information here. Um, we work both uh, what we call theory-driven and also data-driven. So, so uh, when you work data-driven, you take your starting point in some data set and you apply data mining techniques, trying to extract what is in the data. Sometimes you might not have all that much data, and then you can use theory-driven approaches instead. So taking your starting point in some theory or some hypothesis of some type of phenomena. And I'll give you examples of both of these approaches. Um, we like to think that the combination of both working theory-driven and data-driven is quite uh, powerful. Also, uh, powerful is to work in a multidisciplinary environment. So FOI is a re big research organization. I think we have more than 900 researchers from very many disciplines. Uh, we always work together with domain experts. Um, so that might be psychologists. It might be, so we did example, um, we did analysis of ISIS propaganda and we worked together with an imam on that project. And we think that working together with domain experts is very important. And, and I think that makes our research environment at FOE quite unique. Um, so some of the example applications that I'm going to try to mention here now, so lone wolf terrorist actors trying to detect uh, warning behaviors uh, of these type of individuals. Uh, we do a lot of work on violent extremism and radicalization. I'll talk about that. Um, also, hate speech and threatening language uh, on internet forums. And then, uh, if we have time, I'll just take some examples of analysis we do on darknet data also. Uh, but I'll begin with lone wolf uh, terrorism. Uh, so, so the, the question is, uh, can we identify potential lone wolf terrorist actors based on their behavior online? So, for example, their textual behavior on internet forums. So that seems like a very difficult problem. We're not very optimistic of the potential to being able to do that. And the reason for that is partly that there is very little data. So if we want to approach this as a machine learning problem, we have very little data to train our models on. So there, there, there is some data here. So there are some manifestos from known lone wolf actors like uh, the Norwegian terrorist Breivik. Um, but a problem with that is that we know that there are multiple authors that have written the manifesto. So we don't really know which parts he actually wrote. There are also some, some letters and, and manifestos from school shooters. But the, the sort of positive class here has a high variance. 
and we have small data, very high variance. And also, so what is the negative class here? Is that everyone else? Is that all other types of internet content? So that's a very difficult learning scenario here. So this is one scenario where we can approach this as a theory-driven uh, problem instead. And there has been a lot of work done on identifying different types of warning behaviors of lone wolf actors. We typically take our starting point in work done by a psychologist called Meloy. He has identified uh, lots of different warning behaviors. Uh, his work is also used in several threat assessment protocols which are used by law enforcement agencies uh, around the world. I think the most famous one is called TRAP-18. It consists of 18 different warning behaviors. Some examples, uh, fixation, that someone is fixating on a particular issue or a particular person. Uh, identification, that you're identifying as a subcommando or a guerrilla unit, uh, and leakage of intent to commit uh, a violent act. So that might be that you're uh, talking on social media about actually go out and performing an act or that you're talking to your friends about that. So perhaps we can use these warning behaviors instead. And, and the way that we try to do that is to identify linguistic markers that manifest these warning behaviors. So some type of linguistic uh, manifestation of, for example, fixation or, or leakage. And then the problem becomes much more simple. So can we detect uh, linguistic markers that manifest warning behaviors? And of course, we're cautiously optimistic of the potential to at least flag content. So, so analysts would be able to use this as a form of information access. Um, so talking about linguistic markers, uh, so what I mean by that is actually quite simple. It's a set of terms. It's a set of keywords. So it's a dictionary of keywords. Um, so for fixation, for, for example, we might list a number of issues that we know uh, is significant for various types of lone wolf factors. So in the case of Breivik, that would be terms like cultural Marxism and Europe and stuff like that. Um, and then, uh, well, so one example could be just if we are interested in, in a, something called brutality, we would just list a number of keywords that sort of manifest brutality. So execute, punish, behead, violent terms like that. So this obviously has a number of problems, and I guess you can see them uh, directly. So when we just use keywords, we're going to overestimate the warning behaviors because of uh, the polysemy of words. So one word can mean several different things, uh, typically always, depending on context. So a word like execute, we don't know if that is actually uh, in the meaning of actually killing someone or carrying out a task, right? Um, but on the other hand, we always also have the underestimation problem, which is caused by, by the other factor, which is synonymy well, or vocabulary variation, that we can have a large number of words referring to the same phenomena. So in the case of the terrorist, terrorist organization, uh, the Islamic State, you can use a wide range of terms referring to that organization. Uh, there are ways of trying to deal with these uh, phenomena. You can use something called word sense disambiguation, which is trying to determine which meaning is activated in a particular context. This can be done. It requires uh, lots of training data. So you need to devote resources if you want to solve this problem. Dealing with the synonymy problem is typically much easier. You can use word embeddings for that. Uh, have you had any uh, presentations touching on word embeddings today? So last year we had an excellent talk about uh, word embeddings from Olof. Um, and this is a known technology nowadays. I don't think I have any more slides on that, no. So uh, you train, uh, you can train a predictive model on large text data or you can just build a co-occurrence uh, matrix and factorize that. And then you end up with a space where words that mean similar things are close in the space. Um, sort of like the TSNE. Uh, projections that you saw. So that's a very effective way of dealing with the synonymy problem. And that is much more cheap also than dealing with the disambiguation problem. So we typically do handle the underestimation problem, but we disregard the overestimation problem. 
Um, uh, we have also developed a small tool for analysts to actually build their word lists uh, because this is standard practice in the sort of security domain to, to produce word lists and do keyword analysis. Uh, so in this small tool, we provide four different word embeddings and I don't think you can see anything here, but so we have a nationalistic uh, word embedding model trained on uh, right-wing extremist content on Swedish. We have a, a English nationalistic uh, word embedding model trained on right-wing extremist content on English, mainly Stormfront. Uh, we have an ISIS uh, word embedding model trained on official ISIS propaganda. And we also have a more generic Swedish model. And then the analyst can simply just upload their file of keywords, press the blue button there, and the model will suggest new terms that you can use uh, in your analysis process. And those terms will then reflect the sort of domain specificity of the domain that you have chosen. So this is a powerful way, a very simple way of dealing with with the vocabulary variation. Okay, so turning to violent extremism, which is, I, I would say, our main uh, research area. Uh, this is funded by a large commission from the Swedish government. Uh, that has been going on for about a year and it will continue going for about two, year, two more years at least. Uh, we have published three reports uh, during this commission so far and these are only available in Swedish, so sorry about that. Uh, the middle one is being translated into English right now. Uh, the first one uh, is more about generally hate speech and uh, extremism in digital environments. The second one is on ISIS propaganda. And our third one, which was published just a couple of weeks ago, uh, called The White Hate, is about right-wing extremism uh, content in Swedish digital media. And we're now starting to work on our next report, which will be on uh, left-wing extremism. We're trying to cover as, as broad a spectrum of extremism as possible. Um, so one of the main analyses that we do on this type of material is what we call thematic analysis, uh, which is simply trying to understand what is being talked about in these environments. So what are the main themes or topics in the data and how do they develop over different domains and over time? Um, so when we talk about thematic analysis, uh, we just simply mean counting occurrences of words in data. So we define a topic as a set of keywords and then we simply count the occurrences of these keywords over time or over uh, domains. So it's a very simple approach. Powerful but simple. But of course, how do we define the themes in the data? So we can have a theory-driven approach. We might know that ISIS, for example, talks a lot about the utopia of the caliphate, for example. Or we might want to extract the themes uh, from the data itself. So how do we do that? So I guess the standard approach would be to use something like a topic model, uh, which I'm guessing many of you are familiar with here. Uh, and there are tons of topic models that you can use, like probabilistic latent semantic analysis, latent Dirichlet allocation, non-negative matrix factorization, hierarchical Dirichlet processes. And does anyone know what the GMNTM stands for? No takers. So that's a Gaussian mixture neural topic model. So you can have your pick here. Uh, now, the problem here is that all of these uh, operate on a doc document structure of the data. So based on the document structure, we're trying to infer a latent distribution of the vocabulary, and that will be your topic distribution. But in many cases, uh, at least in our domain, we don't really have a clear document structure of the data set. So that might be because we have a streaming data set, for example, or it might be that we have very high variance in the document length. And then it will be problematic to use standard topic models in this case. So one of the ways that we approach the problem is instead to use embedding techniques. Uh, so if we train a word embedding in the proper way, we will approximate topical relations in the embedding space. And then we can simply apply a clustering technique on the resulting embedding space. And using something like a Gaussian mixture model on top of that, it will be a nice approximation to a topic model. And we don't have to require the document structure. So this is something that we have applied on ISIS propaganda. So um, we have applied these models to all propaganda we could find online. And that includes all of the official ISIS magazines, uh, which are glossy magazines, uh, very editorial and very professionally uh, built. Uh, 
Dabek and Romaya is the name of these magazines. And we have applied this automatic method on all of the data and used that as a tool to extract topics. And these are some of the topics that we could extract using this method. They're violent topics, of course, and that goes in line with previous research. Uh, we can note that there are some very specific things like vehicles uh, at the bottom there and also a knife topic. And if we look at how these topics develop over time in ISIS propaganda, we can see some interesting uh, things here. First of all, uh, the propaganda changes uh, in, uh, in nature around September last year, which is when the caliphate starts to break down. And the propaganda, instead of talking about how, how nice everything is in the caliphate and come here and join us, instead we're, the propaganda is now talking about stay in your own countries and perform terrorist acts uh, in your homelands. And you can see that the propaganda becomes more violent and especially the vehicle topic, which is the uh, second to, to last one, the bottom one, the uh, pink one, that increases a lot in recent propaganda, which uh, in a quite unpleasant way correlates with, uh, with recent terrorist attacks in Europe. Um, but of course, we use lexical analysis here, right? We're counting occurrences of words. Um, we do know that that is not the most accurate approach here. So here you can see, this is from Eisenstein, published a paper on this. Uh, this is a sentiment analysis problem, uh, very simple type of problem, four different data sets. The blue boxes are just the standard sentiment lexicon. The red boxes are when you perform the lexical analysis in a little smarter way using weights. Uh, but of course, using supervised machine learning will beat the lexical system all the time. And we do know that this is the case. Uh, and we do use machine learning for various types of things also at FOA. So one of the things that we do is gender classification. So we might be interested in profiling different types of texts. Uh, we have used a gender classification system of Swedish uh, to, to analyze who writes on uh, alt-right news sites uh, in Sweden. So of Pixlat is one of the biggest alt-right news sites. It's not around anymore. It's now called Samnut or Samhällsnut. Um, and looking at the gender classification results, uh, it's mostly men or it's only men who write the editorial content. Looking at the comment sections on that website, it's also mostly men who write, angry white men who write on these websites. Okay, but um, annotation is hard. Uh, we know that, collecting data. So we have provided also an annotation tool uh, and this is, there is no magic in this one. It's just a simple interface because when we try to collect data from psychologists or other domain experts, uh, the key is to just keep things as simple as possible. Many of these people are not even used to using computers for things, right? So this needs to be as simple as possible. So in this case, we have some expl explanatory text in the blue box. You have the text to be annotated in the, in the field here. And then in this case, we just have two classes and the analyst can simply just click the red or green button or the gray one, which is just not relevant. So using that, we can collect training data. So uh, when we have collected training data, it's interesting to look at the inter-annotator agreement. So how well do human annotators uh, conform to each other? That gives us a good idea of how, how difficult the problem is that we're dealing with. Um, Looking at something like detecting part of speech in language. So if, if a word is a noun or a verb or adjective, we have very high inter-annotator agreement. And that's a very simple uh, classification test. We can expect performance of part of speech taggers to be higher than 90%, uh, even in general text. Uh, but looking at something like sentiment analysis, uh, the inter-annotator agreements are typically more variable so in, in, in nice scenarios, we can reach up to maybe 70% agreement between human annotators. But in general text, it will be even lower than that. So if you're actually basing your, uh, your product on sentiment analysis, you should be aware that the expected performance on general language will not be very high. 
Of course, if you have a very domain-specific problem like determining reviews on Amazon, you can maybe reach up to 90% performance, but not on general text. Uh, things like hate speech, which is of interest for us, is even more difficult. The inter-annotator I mean, inter agreement figures around 30% is just very low. So this is a very hard problem, very subjective problem, and probably very context-dependent problem. So in situations like this, you can ask the question, is it even worth it to try to collect training data and build a machine learning model? Or should you just take a theory-driven approach? So talk to your psychologist and figure out what is hate speech. And uh, just an example of what we can do to approach this problem. So this is, uh, uh, there are no names here. So these are just uh, professions, different professions. Uh, so how much uh, are people talking about these type of individuals on right-wing extremism uh, forums in Swedish? And we can see that people talk mostly about politicians uh, on these forums. But if we compare that with using something we call hate int intensity or a hate intensity score, where we use five different factors, uh, so words expressing death, words expressing anger, uh, negative remarks, worry, and swear words, you can see that there are other types of individuals who are more exposed to this type of language use. In this case, there is a public person, a man, who receives a lot of hate intensity. So this might be one way forward, uh, and this is something that we are working on right now with our psychologists. Okay, so some of the specific challenges and solutions uh, in this area then, so working in a, in a domain where we often don't have very much training data. Uh, if we have training data, it tends to be very small amounts of training data. Uh, also, Sometimes when we work with our clients, we don't even get any data because they can't give us access to data. So that means we need to train our models on some other type of data and then port them to, to whatever data it should be applicable to. So we really need to worry about domain dependence or domain independence here. Um, so some of the ways that we try to approach uh, these problems, we've heard examples of that before. Active learning is a very good approach to build training data. So if we have very small amounts of data, we can at least start to try to produce more data using active learning. <coughs> Domain independence, so we're looking at transfer learning a lot uh, right now, trying to build predefined models or pre-trained models on very large data set and then uh, domain adapt these models using transfer, transfer learning. And we could also add, of course, uncertainty, as we have heard. We're also looking at conformal predictions as a tool uh, for the analysts, which is, I think, is quite interesting. Uh, I'm sort of running out of time, but I think I should just take some examples of the things that we have done on darknet data. I guess I don't have to uh, explain what darknet is. Uh, so th just the point of darknet is that you can remain anonymous in the communication. So it's encrypted and it bounces around. Uh, before reaching the destination. So you don't know who is communicating uh, with who. Um, so what we do is not really data collection here. We, we have produced an analysis platform for analysts to be able to analyze darknet data. So we're not really doing any data collection from darknet itself. We're using an open um, dump from Agora Market. So Agora Market was the biggest uh, marketplace for drugs on darknet between 2000. Uh, 13 and 2015. You can also buy other stuff, or you could buy other stuff on, on Agora Market. Um, so one of the things I can do, and I'm sorry, this doesn't really uh, reflect well on the screen, I guess, but you can look at price development for various types of drugs, for example. So in the upper upper plot there is the price development based on the actual ads on the Agora Marketplace. And on the lower one, you can see what people have actually uh, paid for the drugs based on the feedback that they give to the sellers. Uh, the price is, is pretty much the same as, as in the ads. At the later part, there is a le less variance in what people actually bought than in, in, in the actual ads. You can also look at the amount that people buy. So the top one is what people offer to sell. Uh, so the, the typical selling amount is one gram of cocaine. But there has been some ads actually offering 10 kilograms of cocaine. <laughs> uh, but based on f um, 
buyer feedback, we see that the vast majority of people buy around one gram of cocaine or thereabouts. There has been someone buying actually one kilogram of cocaine uh, during this period or so. We can also look at the distribution channels. So this is where drugs are being shipped from and to where. Uh, the major shipping nubs are, are Netherlands, United States, Germany and, and UK and Australia. And we can also see that they're mainly sh shipping within the countries, uh, not so much uh, without. We can also look at uh, where the drugs are being uh, manufactured or the origin. Uh, the vast amount is unspecified, but we do see Peru, Colib Colombia, Bolivia, uh, UK also. And to where they are shipped and, and then sold. Uh, we can also look at where people don't like to ship drugs. And surprisingly, uh, Sweden turns up as one of the major destinations where people don't want to ship their drugs. That might be because the Swedish Customs is doing a good job. But in many cases, it's actually because people don't trust PostNord, because drugs get lost. Yes. So, surprising side effect of having a bad postal service is we don't get very much drugs into the country. Okay. Thank you.